All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the FIHA Registered Sanitarian Exam Review. Um, so today we're going to be covering some topics around food safety and food inspections. Um, my, my name is Tracy Michelson, and I'll be your presenter today. So I'm just curious. Um, we want this to be, you know, fairly interactive. I have, a, I actually do have a ton of slides that I'm going to go through. Um, but some of them we can probably just brush over because I think they're just going to be a review for you. But I'm curious as to, and then we can um, obviously use the chat to ask any questions, but also hoping that we could do um, be a little bit interactive as well. So in the chat, can you um, can you answer this question? Are you here because you're going to be taking the RS exam, or are you here because you're already registered and you're looking for CEUs? Just trying to get a gauge of who my audience is today and, and how I can best um, um, suit your needs for this particular webinar. Also, that lets me know who, um, oh, good. <laughs> but you guys can hear me. <laughs> so, all right. So, it looks like we've got hmm, probably more people here for CEUs, but um, definitely some here for the exam. So, that's great. Um, all right. So just to let you know, um, Michael, and I want to thank Michael and Tiha for inviting me to come on and present to you guys today. Um, I actually uh, am part of MIHA, if you guys are familiar with that. So FIHA is an affiliate of MIHA. I'm on the board there. So um, have been engaged with MIHA for quite a while. I actually hold two credentials myself through MIHA. Um, one is the CPFS, which I got back in 2000. So my goodness, 21 years ago now. <laughs> or time goes. Um, and then the REHS or RS, which I, re uh, I earned in 2007. So it's been a little while since I've taken the exam. I do remember it. It was that stressful, <laughs> um, especially since most of my background is in food um, rather than some of the other categories that, uh, that it covers. So, so like I said, we'll, we'll be going through some, some information on food and food inspections. Um, if you have any questions, if I'm going too fast or too slow, just again, use the chat function um, and hopefully you'll get a ton of good, valuable, useful information out of here and find the next hour and a half to be uh, useful and, and valuable. So, okay, so move on and I will admit I am not a technology person. I'm a food safety person, so uh, there might be a few glitches with the, <laughs> with the presentations. And I'm working from home, so you may hear some puppies or cats in the background. So I apologize for any of that at this point, but um, hang in there with me, and, and we'll get through it together, like like most of the virtual <laughs> situations that have been out there. So, um, all right. So, so one thing I, I did want to kind of start out with is just the, the you know the understanding that it's important that you not only know the information you found in the study materials or that you've read and learned through ServSafe or, or in the food code, but also how to really apply that to what you see when you're out doing your inspections, training, and support visits. You know, I found ServSafe was pretty easy to pass as an exam if you just kind of memorize the manual. Um, and while the CPFS was a little bit harder, um, again, it seemed like if you memorized the FDA food code and you had some basic knowledge of how to apply that, you were good. Um, for some reason, the RS exam, on the other hand, mm, seemed a little bit more complex. So for those of you who are already <laughs> certified, if you can remember, it seems like they, they, it's not just memorizing, it's knowing the information and then knowing how to apply it. So the questions are more about applying how to, um, uh, how to apply the knowledge versus just do you know the information. Um, and then it really seemed like they chose more your questions and topics <laughs> than what you normally find on on some of the other food safety type certifications. So so just be aware of that. I was I actually was kind of trying to um, get a gauge of how it might have changed, and I was looking through. Um, I think it was like a Quizlet or a Quiz Breaker. They've got like flashcards that you can use, and it seemed like there was a ton of them on like milk and milk pasteurization and a lot around shellfish and oysters. So just be aware that, you know, they can throw in some oddy ones in there. So when you're going through all of your study materials, you may run across um, some of that as well as just the normal typical stuff that we'll kind of cover today. So um, I believe at this point, uh, Niha's REHS exam still is just the, has the 40 questions around kind of food safety facility 
um, inspection questions, and then five around HACCP. So just being aware of that helps a little bit. Um, and then the other thing is, is that uh, I will provide you guys with this deck, this training deck. So if for those of you that are still working on um, getting registered, this will be another study guide for you to utilize. All right, so uh, we will be covering basically food safety related information during the review today. Um, I'll be moving quickly to ensure that we can get through all this material. Like I said, I've got a lot of stuff there. Um, I've got a few questions at the end that we can do kind of a, a test, um, a little test for. And then if we have uh, time, we can do some uh, Q&A at the very end. All right. so. I always like to start out with this particular uh, list just because it really does hone in on the top five risk factors for foodborne illness, and this is based on CDC. So um, the way that I like to think of it is that um, these can result in someone getting ill or they often result in, you know, a full-blown uh, food outbreak occurring. Most of these situations are unintentional and are due to lack of training or lack of understanding or someone trying to save time and or money. So really it's, it's making sure that even from an operator perspective, everybody understands what food safety is. Building a good food safety culture and having that training in place um, really helps to, to prevent these types of things. So you will see as we go through our review that we talk about different ways to prevent each of these incidences. So something to always kind of keep in mind when you're out, you know, working with different, um, different facilities. So uh, everyone should be familiar with the definition of foodborne illness. Um, the tricky part of foodborne illnesses are that most of them go undiagnosed and unreported. So the true extent of their occurrence is an educated guess usually, um, unless something is reported or two or more people involved in an outbreak talk about their situation, generally it will go unnoticed. All right, so we'll be covering these in quite a bit of detail, but most incidences of contamination result from these three categories. Uh, most are impossible to see during consumption other than, you know, some of the physical ones. And those can be both harmful and or cause, you know, pretty much a major X factor. So um, if I find a fingernail, is it going to hurt me? Hmm, probably not, but I'm going to be pretty grossed out by it. For the most part, the industry has moved away from the phrase uh, potentially hazardous food. So I think if people are still using that, you might want to start to kind of uh, move away from that. The the food code, the FDA food code is now using the TCS or uh, time and temperature control for safety now. And, and I think most um, state and local ones uh, are moving towards that as well. So, uh, and while raw proteins are cause for concern when it comes to cross-contamination, uh, it is the ready-to-eat foods that tend to be the main food-related carrier. Um, so thinking about not just uh, the raw meats or, or um, chicken or whatever it might be. Um, there's a lot of times where cooked foods, washed fruits and vegetables, deli meats, um, and even we've seen where, you know, flour or that type of thing can, um, can be a vehicle as well. So, and obviously you also have human contamination um, through fecal oral routes that we have to be concerned with. So. Okay, and so on the flip side, when we're talking about rules, how to keep food safe, it would be kind of the opposite of the, the top five risk factors. Um, and again, we'll be kind of talking about some of these as we go along. All right, so what is contamination? Um, while there are some food products that are inherently um, have some hazards, so we're thinking again about raw proteins that naturally have some types of pathogens on it, uh, most issues are related to contamination occurring somewhere along the food handling process. So this is often known as the cross-contamination. And as we can see here, contaminants can come from a lot of sources, um, which are most are naturally present in our environment. So we're doing something to, to prevent, eliminate, or, or reduce, contr somehow control it. So, um, so another thing to always be thinking about as, as we're working with our, um, our food facilities. Um, so we have the three, the biological, the physical, and the chemical. Um, 
generally, I think biological tends to be the one of most concern, um, just because it, 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 generally you don't see it. They're, they're hard to, to identify and when they're contaminating something as well as sometimes once you've, you've ingested it. So um, biological pathogens can cause illness in humans. Um, these illnesses fall into three categories, infection, um, intoxication or infection that produces a toxin. Um, so food infection, the way I like to look at it is food infection is bacteria. You eat the bacteria, it grows inside of you and causes an infection that results in those foodborne illness symptoms. So it's your body's way of trying to eject it um, once it's <laughs> once it's got into your system. So um, some examples of that is listeria, salmonella, E. coli, and campylobacter. Food intoxication is where the bacteria grows and produces a toxin that causes the foodborne illness symptoms, either before or after ingestion. So some examples of that would be Clostridium botulinum, Bacillus cereus, and Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and then obviously there are, are certain toxins that you can ingest just um, naturally from, and we'll talk a little bit more about that further on. So. Um, some reportable pathogens or foodborne illnesses. Um, according to the Food and Drug Administration, there are over 40 kinds of bacteria, viruses, parasites, and molds that can occur in food and cause a foodborne illness. Thank goodness we don't have to memorize all of those. <laughs> that would be quite a bit. So um, they have uh, identified six that are believed to be highly contagious and occur most often in food handling facilities. So that's where they came up with the, the big six. Um, and keep in mind, obviously, as you should know, that um, they're reportable to the local health department or regulatory agency. Um, and then at that point, if that they sh they should report something, um, as well as I think usually the medical provider will will report some of these to the um, that local health department. The health department will then work with the facility um, team to figure out when the ill employee can can return to work. So. Um, some common symptoms, so there are a number of foodborne illness symptoms one can look for when diagnosing what somebody has. Um, a person could have one, they could have all of them, they could vary in, secure, in severity, time of onset, the length of that illness. Um, they may even be common for other illnesses, non-foodborne illnesses like COVID-19, which we've, you know, we've recently encountered, or even something like IBS, where someone has a problem, like a continuous problem. So it does make it really difficult to identify that someone has a foodborne illness. And I think sometimes people are embarrassed to talk about these types of personal issues and therefore don't really think to report it or talk to someone else to find out if they've had similar situations or experiences as well. So um, so the important point here is, is that everyone in the food facility is educated on what those symptoms are, um, that they should report them to their supervisor immediately, and they should not return to work until they are symptom free. All right. Okay. So thinking, continuing to talk about bacteria. So there are certain conditions for growth, and this is a really good one if you're getting ready for the exam, because um, this will really help you work through some um, some of the questions that might be on there. So um, I'm sure most people are, are familiar with the acronym of FAT, FATOM, um, and and I, like I said, I, I do find it very very helpful. So uh, like people, bacteria need food to survive. So that's the F on here. Um, the type of food may vary, but generally they like the proteins, they like moisture, they like warm temperatures, so kind of like people as well, or plants or anything else that might be out there, any living thing. Um, and then they also uh, have to react, they do react to certain acidities, so, um, so definitely you want to kind of look at that as we go along. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, obviously, about temperature um, and the temperature danger zone a little bit further on. So from an acidity perspective, generally most most pathogens cannot grow um, at a pH of 4.2 or below. I know that in the past there was a lot of talk around 4.6, and I think that's still relevant for most pathogens, but I think there's a few that um, can grow within that range, you know, the 4.2 to 4.6. So um, we want to keep that in mind. And then for the second half of the FATOM, um, they, like most living organisms, they also need time to grow and multiply. So again, that kind of depends. And, you know, a uh, rule of thumb is, with the temperature danger zone um, is the four hours. But I know we've got some some wiggle room there uh, in some of the, um, if the temperature remains low enough, 
um, and they have different needs for oxygen and water. So I didn't put the, the I put the aerobic and the anaerobic. I didn't put the um, Oh, I forget there's that one that's kind of in between where they can go either way. So, so just kind of keeping that in mind when you're doing any kind of um, a map or, or ROP where we're removing um, oxygen and what could potentially grow um, in that environment. And then from a moisture perspective, uh, the water activity zero to one is our range. Water would be, you know, one. So that's the most that you can have. So anything, generally anything low 0.85, um, would not support the growth of, of pathogens or bacteria. All right, so if you guys have, have taken a look at the FDA food code when you're searching for um, water activity and pH levels to really get a gauge of whether something's TS, TCS or not TCS, that's where I've got I got this table from, so you can reference it there. Um, I do find that it is a very helpful chart if you're trying to kind of figure out if something um, is TCS or not TCS. So keeping in mind, there's two charts. I'll show you this one, and then the next slide has the other one. So this one is based on vegetative cells and spores in food that is not heat treated or heat treated uh, but not packaged. All right. um, so so slightly different. Um, and so here, this I, I jotted down a couple notes. So staff, um, staff could grow at 4.6, but uh, once you hit 4.2, you're good. And so that's where they're kind of coming up with these ranges up here. Um, Listeria is good up to 4.4, a pH of 4.4. And then from a water activity, um, staff is good up to uh, 0.88. And then this was the other one that I was talking about. So this one, uh, this table is for spores in food heat, food spores in food heat treated to destroy vegetative cells and subsequently packaged. So good reference if you're trying to determine whether something's TCS or not. Um, and generally, I'd say that has to do with at least my experience is um, is trying to figure out if something can be held at room temperature out at ambient versus refrigerated. All right, so let's uh, let's move on to viruses. So viruses are the leading cause of foodborne illness, if you think about it, since norovirus is one of the leading causes of foodborne illness. I'm not sure of how many of you have um, had the experience of having to deal with a norovirus outbreak, um, but they're not that fun. <laughs> I can certainly say that. Uh, and then, so it's often, and obviously norovirus is often transmitted through airborne vomit particles or surfaces that have not been cleaned properly after an emetic event has occurred. So I know that most uh, most companies, uh, the food code now requires that someone have a vomit and diarrhea cleanup procedure. Um, and it's important that uh, food facilities have the right type of chemicals to be able to um, to clean up norovirus or the potential for norovirus. And I know it gets a little tricky because uh, most chemicals can uh, either are just sanitizers that take care of the normal stuff, E. coli, salmonella, that type of thing. Um, there are a few that are norovirus rated and some are hepatitis A rated and then some are coronavirus rated, but it doesn't seem like they're, you can find an all in one anywhere. So, um, so yeah, so it's important for food facilities to understand um, what type of chemicals are out there that they can use and, and what they need to use in, in certain situations. So, uh, so really when it comes to viruses, the two main viruses of concern are the hepatitis A and norovirus. All right. And then here's another chart that I find very useful. And I actually, I have, I have my own hard copy here that's laminated. I'm, I can't even remember where I got it from, <laughs> but I'm very happy to have it. I've referenced it many, many times over the years. Um, I did find this out just by like kind of Googling it. Um, so it, you can find an electronic copy as well. So I would say this is a good one to have on hand, both to study for your exam or just in general when you're, when you're doing your work and um, someone starts reporting different different symptoms and onsets and different you know foods that they might have consumed um, and again it's a good 
quick reference where you don't have to bust out your little book on, you know, every disease that's out there. <laughs> if, if you really need to dig in deep, then I'd go to that one, uh, which I know is one of the, the suggested reading resources for the exam. Um, but this is a good one as well, like I said, to kind of keep on hand so, and use for, for, for your study guide. All right, uh, from a parasite perspective, um, parasites are less common but still harmful pathogens that we can find in our food and environment. Uh, some common examples include the chickenella, which used to be uh, fairly common in undercooked pork. I think there's um, something they do now during processing in, in the freezing um, that helps to, to destroy, destroy that. Um, and then sometimes we hear about Girardia and Cryptosporidium infections due to someone drinking contaminated water while hiking or camping or um, in different ways that way. So. Um, Again, not not as common. I don't really think you hear as much, but you know, I think maybe from a, a, a an environmental health you know specialist perspective, you probably do maybe more on the epidemiology side than you probably would from hearing somebody uh, consuming something at a and complaining about something from a, a food facility, a restaurant, or retail, or even a manufacturer. So, uh, another less common biological hazard is is uh, fungi. So this one can be a bit confusing since there's good fungi and bad, bad fungi. So uh, food providers should be educated on what mushrooms are safe and only buy, you know, approved items. Uh, and while there are some products that use yeast and mold to produce the desired result within that food, uh, we also need to be aware of unwanted forms of these fungi and make sure we are monitoring for them and discarding anything that has um, this type of growth on it, uh, if it isn't meant to actually be there. So I know it's hard. I, I love my cheese. So when that mold starts showing up on the cheese, I'm like, oh, I'll just cut it off or, you know, but um, if that wasn't the, the mold that was used to make the cheese, then I might be, um, might be a tempting fate there a little bit. So um, and then uh, the last category of the biological hazards are the toxins. So these can be, come in uh, various forms and be the result of natural processes. Uh, like stigiotera in fish or due to mishandling of food. So uh, most symptoms will occur fairly quickly, but like uh, other illnesses can vary in onset time and severity. What we often see with toxin symptoms are the common, uh, the common ones like vomiting and diarrhea combined with some other unique ones like high breathing issues and neurological symptoms. So it usually will present in a way that it'll be pretty obvious um, that it's not just a regular uh, pa uh, virus or, or bacteria type of, uh, of a situation. And then chemical contaminants usually come in two forms, um, some type of cleaning or personal product that actually enters the food uh, or cookware made of a metal that leaches into the product during the cooking process. So um, symptoms here again are fairly, usually fairly quick and mimic some of the biological ones. Um, so it's just something that, that, that we should be keeping a close eye on to make sure that they're handling um, chemicals appropriately to avoid that. And the last hazard category are physical contaminants. Um, this tends to be the least likely in, in retail and food service settings since you know you can usually see them, catch them before they go out to, to the customer. Uh, they can be, uh, vary from extremely harmful to just gross. Uh, most are accidentally introduced from uh, the environment, but some are part of the original food, like bones or or fruit pits or something like that. So uh, it's important that food handlers are paying close attention to the product they are preparing and recognize when a physical contaminant may be present. So I, I would say I've, I've often been surprised when we've had guest complaints or customer complaints um, that there's something obvious in there and, and just somebody didn't catch it because they're just in such a hurry. So um, so it's something we want to make sure that they're aware of and are kind of keeping an eye open for. All right. Um, so let's move on a little bit. Uh, another hazard that doesn't always fall within the ones that we were just talking about, although they kind of do, if you think about it from a, maybe like a chemical perspective, is um, allergens. So an allergic reaction is when the immune system mistakenly considers the allergen to be harmful and attacks the food protein. So the amount of protein needed to cause an allergic reaction will vary from uh, person to person, as will the severity of the symptoms. So um, it's important that we're very clear where there are allergens, how we handle the allergens, um, 
and making sure that everybody's trained and informing everybody um, so that we don't run into any situations um, since most people experience just mild to severe symptoms, but it, it can occasionally result in the death if not treated quickly enough. Well, there are more than 160 food items that can cause allergic reactions. Um, just eight account for 90% of all of those reactions in the U.S. Um, these eight foods, food items are known as the big eight. Um, there are also milder reactions that uh, people can have to food which fall within the categories of sensitivity or intolerance. So these tend to be, or these tend to produce less severe symptoms or reactions, but still of some concern um, to the people that have them. Okay, so moving away from our hazards, let's start talking about prevention. Um, and, and I would say in my mind, and I think most, Hand washing is the number one activity that a food handler can perform uh, to prevent the spread of illness and contamination. Knowing when, where, and how to wash hands is critical in keeping everybody safe and healthy. And that doesn't matter if you're working as a food handler in a food facility, at home, um, at the grocery store, <laughs> you know, at the mall, wherever it might be. I think it's very critical that people understand um, that hand washing is, is very, very important. Um, the list may seem endless as to when someone needs to wash their hands, so I don't know that you necessarily have to memorize it. Uh, the key is to recognize when someone's hands are dirty or contaminated and ensure that they take the time to stop and wash them to prevent spreading anything around. So sometimes, you know, they'll feel dirty and that'll be the indicator to stop and wash, but a lot of times um, it takes a bit more thought and, and effort to realize that, hey, I I just touched something or I did something that is going to cause them to be contaminated. And um, the whole process should take at least 20 seconds. So I know there, um, at one point, I think there was uh, a discussion or a rule around scrubbing your hands for the full 20 seconds, but um, they pulled back on that. And now they're talking about the 10 to, to 15 seconds. Um, it, the food code states use running warm water, but a lot of locals still use the 100 uh, degrees as does a lot of the um, the inspection reports. So just keep that in mind as from an exam perspective, if they say, you know, washing your hands, the actual scrubbing would be the 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, and then the key with the hand sanitizers is that you are, um, is that you're always washing your hands before you put on a hand sanitizer. So I was just on a, um, a round table yesterday where they were talking about everybody how everybody's kind of getting into the habit of oh i use hand sanitizers for the the pandemic for covid 19 so i'm just hand sanitizing hand sanitizing, and they're and they've kind of got out, out of out of the um the habit of washing their hands first they, they think okay because it works for the coronavirus i can just do it all the time well the difference between that is the hand washing helps from a contaminant, dirt, and and pathogen, kind of like a, a foodborne illness pathogen perspective, the the disinfectant, basically the hand sanitizer, is for respiratory infections or respiratory pathogens. So so it's something to keep in mind, and that they felt like there might need to be some retraining going on once the pandemic is over to remind people, hey, it's still more important to wash your hands than than to use the hand sanitizer. So. Um, and you might run into that as well. Um, okay, so single-use gloves. I like to think of gloves as a combination of your hand and a utensil. So um, it allows you to touch the food directly as long as the glove is clean, you know. Uh, but once it is dirty, torn, or contaminated, or, or you switch to different tasks where cross-contamination between tasks, could occur, it needs to be removed and a hand wash performed. So, so that's one thing that you got to kind of keep in mind when you're in facilities is how how everybody's kind of interpreting changing a task is, or if if they felt like their glove is dirty versus not dirty, that type of thing. So, um, but it is important, I think, to continue to, to monitor and and um, talk about that need for a hand wash in between. Um, while there are some exceptions that allow bare hand contact with ready to eat foods, it is difficult to really manage them. Um, here we list a couple of those exceptions, which indicate that there will be an additional kill step after the, the after handling the food. Um, so 
I know uh, in general when you're looking at uh, food facilities, at least for the, the larger chains, um, a lot of times they'll just have a, a blanket glove policy just to make it easier um, to manage from their from their perspective. So uh, we should all be familiar with, you know, hair restraint, uniform jewelry requirements, beard restraint standards are generally any growth greater than a quarter or inch on the um, on the face. And obviously, a plain wedding bag still remains the only jewelry allowed. And I know it's gotten harder with um, watches lately because a lot of people have the, <laughs> have like the Fitbits and the and the smart watches or whatever that help them kind of monitor what's going on. Um, so to to get that off of them um, it tends to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, employees can drink from a covered container if they handle the container carefully to prevent contamination of their hands, the container, and exposed food, utensils, and equipment. Um, a correctly covered container will include a lid with a straw or um, they've updated the food code to allow a sip lid top, so the little flip up top um, that has to stay up. They, not, they can't be touching it all the time. Um, and then tasting can occur, but only when checking the quality of the product in a sanitary manner. So again, um, single use spoon, um, not eating over prep areas, that type of thing. Okay, uh, illnesses, so reporting illness. Every food facility should have a written illness policy. Uh, I believe that is also in the food code. All employees need to be trained on this policy uh, during an inspection or an audit. Both managers and employees should be able to list this, at least the symptoms. Um, and then I would believe managers should be able to list majority of the illnesses as well. It is a best practice to have everything documented and on site to show compliance. And again, you'll see a difference probably between more of your mom and pop uh, facilities versus larger chains where they've got a corporate food safety team that helps them kind of put this together and ensures that training is going on. But I think that is one of the most critical things because it tends to be um, more, I think, of uh, uh, an employee being ill and working versus, you know, contamination necessarily being moved around in the facility once, um, when something happens. Okay, I see it. I've got a question here about the quarter inch hair length guidance come from. So that I would not, I, I, you probably won't see that anywhere on a, um, on a, uh, a, like a food code or a manual or anything like that. That's just something that from an industry perspective we talked about and I've worked for three different uh, restaurant companies now and generally that's where we kind of come to a, an agreement because it's hard to say what is the, the right length or not the right length. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Thank you um, for, for asking that question so that that's, that's clear that that's just been a policy in the companies that I've worked at based on what we kind of came up with as what made the most sense. Um, from a potential hazard perspective. Okay. Um, all right. So once somebody does report a, that they have some symptoms or um, or an illness, what happens then? Well, you need to decide. The facility needs to decide whether they can restrict somebody from working or if they need to exclude them. So um, the FDA food co code, as well as various state and local codes. Uh, do provide direction on when an employee has a foodborne illness, whether and whether um, they should result in that restriction or exclusion. Um, I have included a few examples here. Um, so when a food handler has like milder symptoms or cold like like symptoms, um, they're generally required to be restricted. Um, if they have um, if they have something more severe, more foodborne illness like um, or they have an actual illness, then generally they would have to be excluded. So the, 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 the problem here is, is there's not a lot of stuff for, for somebody to do in a food handling facility or food pre preparation facility to do that is restricted from handling food or food contact surfaces. So um, unless, you know, they're going to be a host or, I don't know, do some janitorial stuff. I mean, you wouldn't even let them be a dishwasher at the point. You know, it's it's hard to really... Um, restrict them. So generally, um, you'd move right into excluding these these types of, of employees if they've got anything that we feel that could be spread to the rest of the team, uh, to the customers, or anything like that. So, um, so 
So again, some of the more severe infections or, or symptoms would be vomiting, diarrhea, and jaundice because they would be clear indicators um, that somebody has some type of a food for illness, even if they haven't gone to get checked and, and um, diagnosed. And then once they are diagnosed, definitely restriction would occur. Um, we would report that to the health department, to you guys, and then you would work with, with that facility um, to determine when that employee can return and if there was anything else we really need to do um, amongst these employees. Okay, so shifting a little bit again here. So let's start talking about um, other preventive measures around um, time and temperature. So um, one of the main ones that we think about when it comes to preventing food burn illnesses other than hand washing and, and, and employee illness, you know, control of employee illness is the time temperature control. And, you know, obviously we're going to have tons of slides on that because there's a lot of information around it. Um, but having food hanging out in the temperature danger zone for too long will cause, path, you know, pathogen growth, um, which can lead to illness in anyone consuming that food. The most common food, um, uh, I think the most common situation is cold or hot holding abuse. Um, that, of something that might have somehow gotten contaminated. So if it, if it's, if it's a sterile product or there's nothing really in there already and you, you have a little abuse, it shouldn't really hurt it too much. Um, but if something that you do have a pathogen in there already, it, you know, it can easily grow, um, during that time frame. So also cooling or reheating improperly. So we do see sometimes where people are trying to reheat in a hot well instead of like microwaving it or putting it in the oven before they move it to the hot well. Um, same thing, I think cooling, I always think of it as, um, uh, oh, it's the end of the night, I'm just going to throw it in the cooler and leave, and I'm not really monitoring it to make sure that it, it you know, gets to the temperature within the, the, the two-stage process. So I think cooking tends to be less common. I mean, you'll probably get more complaints around cooking things being raw because uh, it's obvious to, <laughs> to to the customers and stuff, but I, I think it's also more obvious to um to the people preparing the food. So um, something to just kind of keep in mind. Uh, obviously, you know, it's important to monitor food temperatures. So they need to have accurate working thermometers and, and that they need to ensure that their, their employees know how to use, how to first, how to check them and make sure that they're calibrated and then um, how to use them. So um, something to keep in mind as you're in the restaurants and you're walking around just to say, hey, where do you have your, your food thermometers? show me, you know, show me best practices on how to use them. Okay, not definitely not going to go through all this. This is something, again, I think that um, we're, we've all been exposed to, um, but the, the idea here is that once the food handler knows how to use their thermometer, uh, we need to make sure they know what temperatures the various foods need to be cooked to. So even from a a high level category. Now there probably would be some job aids or, or different things around that they can reference when they need to. Um, but it's important that they at least have some basic knowledge around this. And I know the, the 2017 food code had some updates around a few um, temperatures. So kind of the 165 being instantaneous and 155 being for 17 seconds now versus that the, it used to be uh, 15. I think there's more more items that are starting to fall under the 155 in terms of uh, how they're um, how they're producing different meats, whether it's ground or injected or mechanically tenderized, or I think even tumbled, you know, uh, marinated and tumbled now kind of falls under that. So, so just kind of keep that in mind um, as you're going through and, and studying or, or out in the restaurants, just looking at different things. So don't forget some cook temperatures may be higher if the product is going to be hot held after the cooking step. And there are some food items that don't have any minimum temperature requirement of their uh, being cooked for immediate service. So those ones kind of get a little tricky at times and, and you got to kind of uh, talk through those to make really understand what, what um, the facility is doing and using with those. Microwave cooking requires some additional safety steps due to the type of heat transfer that occurs in the cooking medium. So again, I have uh, I have an argument with my husband all the time that hey, you got to leave it in the in the microwave for two minutes after <laughs> after you're done with the cooking process. And he says, no, you don't. And I can't move him away from that leap. So um, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, people out there uh, that agree that would agree with him that don't realize that that's that's really a, a critical step. So um, there are four approved thigh methods that can be used. The most common generally is just putting it in the cooler or the refrigerator. 
um, to, to thaw naturally, but the other one I generally see in restaurants and, and retail is running in, under cool running water. Um, there you gotta, again, remind them, hey, the water shouldn't be more than 70 degrees. The product needs to stay at 41 or below because um, they tend to just start it and walk away. So they need to really monitor that closely. Um, obviously, it also can be part of the cooking process or they can um, thaw it in the microwave as well. So cooling is usually done in a, as a two-stage process, uh, although it could happen all at once. So if it's just a small amount of food and you just want to throw it in the cooler, I'm thinking like you cook rice or pasta or something like that, it can be you know, easily popped in, into the refrigeration unit and cooled fairly quickly. Um, it is important, you know, and, and I like to talk to, to uh, the facilities about this, but it really is important to monitor that cooling times and temperatures, you know, and ensure that it gets completed correctly. Um, and there's no possibility um, of pathogen growth due to temperature abuse. So again, I think the big the big challenge is, hey, at the end of the night, I'm pulling out some some stuff that I'm going to save as leftovers. It's just going to go into the cooler, and then I'm going home, and I don't really know um, how quickly I got down. So so at least getting the the cooling. The first stage is done before you walk away, you know, before you leave, and then, you know, checking it first thing in the morning just to make sure that it actually got down to 41 is, is a, a best practice there. So, uh, reheating foods to the proper temperature is important as they've already gone through multiple, you know, kind of heat cool steps and are more likely to have some abuse that occurred and therefore need the maximum kill step necessary to offset that. So, that's why they um, go all the way up to 165 on that. Again, should never be reheated in a holding unit since that will most likely not get it up to the temperature that it needs to get to. All right, holding foods. So cold holding tends to be more of a challenge, I think, than hot holding in most food facilities. Uh, most likely due to the great number, the larger number of cold products that are being held versus uh, hot products. Um, also, there's more holding equipment. So if you think about the number of refrigeration units that are in a in a um, in a in a kitchen compared to hot holding, that you know kind of makes sense. So it is important to monitor both the product and the equipment throughout the day to ensure it's holding properly. Um, the I think the 2017 FDA food code actually mentions checking and holding temperatures every four hours. Now. Hot holding probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Nothing really stays out for four hours, um, other than you know maybe I guess maybe you could have some some soups and sauces or something. But generally they move through that pretty quickly. It's the cold holding when you have all the refrigeration to, um, equipment that you want to kind of try to keep a close eye on. Um, I I have found in in my experience that you know they'll they'll do their normal checks one, once or twice a day, looking at the the equipment and then they get busy and then they don't really pay attention to it and sometimes in the middle of the day it it goes into defrost when it shouldn't be or it it they got unplugged or something happened and and um, they haven't caught it and stuff starts to get a little bit warmer so something that I always kind of coach on to make sure that they're always aware of what's going on with the refrigeration unit so uh, holding food without temperature control is an approved process um, they mentioned it in the food code, and, and I think a lot of um, a lot of facilities do use it. Um, it, it. It does need to be managed closely, so um, it does come with some safety rules and measures to ensure food doesn't remain in the temperature temperature danger the sorry temperature danger zone for too long. Uh, it requires proper labeling, monitoring, and handling of the food once the time limit is up. So making sure that it, you know it they discard the food once we've hit that. That limit. So, um, different health departments and regulatory agencies may require additional information and approvals to use this process. So, something to be aware. Um, what if, if you guys have something in your code that indicates that that they might need to have um, written approval or written procedures on on hand that they can show you guys when when you come in. All right, uh, another food or another safety measure that can offset one of the foodborne illness risk factors is to ensure that a food, uh, food facility is only purchasing products from safe, wholesome, and quality uh, locations um, or from reputable suppliers. So these suppliers should be licensed and inspected by a regulatory agency, whether that's you or the Department of Ag or wherever it might be. Um, all products should be inspected upon receiving and rejected if unacceptable or not approved. 
Uh, key drop deliveries are becoming more common um, and should receive the same level of vigilance at check-in and put away as an attended delivery. Uh, food temperatures and condition of products should be checked prior to placing in storage. So not sure if you guys come across key drop deliveries too much, um, but I know uh, that was one of those areas of, of you know, you got to be very dil diligent to make sure that they're the the delivery guys are doing what they need to to get the food in and and in the right place. So, from receiving an inspection perspective, uh, shellfish and fish that is going to be eaten raw or partially cooked require additional check and steps upon delivery. So, um, there will most likely be a few questions around this on the exam. I did notice that there was a couple flashcards, and I think there was maybe one. Um, in some of the review questions. So uh, uh, shellfish, the, the shellfish, you know, shell stock identifi uh, identification tags, I'm talking too fast here, <laughs> um, are really important to make sure that they have them on hand for the 90 days after the shellfish has been consumed. And then um, again, if they're doing anything with um, raw or undercooked or partially cooked fish, uh, they have a similar, similar documentation or record perspective there. Mm -hmm. uh, labeling food is important for, for many reasons. Uh, illness have occurred when unlabeled chemicals were mistaken for foods such as flour, sugar, and baking powder. Um, customers have also suffered allergic reactions when food was unknowingly prepped with a food allergen that was not labeled. And it is necessary, oh, I'm sorry, it is not necessary to label food if it clearly will not be mistaken for another item. Um, the food must be easily identified by sight, though. So, so it's something to kind of keep in mind. I think best practice would just be to label everything. So obviously some stuff needs to be labeled with, with a date marking, but others just with their common name if, if it's not clear what they are. Refer refrigeration slows the growth of most bacteria, but some types grow well at refrigeration temperatures. So when a food is refrigerated for long periods of time, these bacteria can grow enough to cause um, illness. So for this reason, a ready-to-eat uh, TCS food must be marked if held for uh, longer than 24 hours. Um, and also the ready-to-eat TCS food must be used or discarded within seven days of either preparation or, um, or opening the package if it was a, a commercially processed item. So we've mentioned the importance of the temperature danger zone and maintaining food temperature outside of this range. And, uh, it is important that all refrigeration units have a working thermometer on the exterior or interior to help monitor them and make sure that they're holding properly. Uh, it is also important that we aren't holding any products past their expiration date. So FIFO, which is first in, first out, is a great way to remember that we need to rotate our products so that uh, we use the, the oldest items first at all times. It is also important how we store items. So we need to, uh, they need to be covered and stored in durable leak-proof containers if stored for any length of time. Um, and they need to be uh, high enough off the floor and away from the walls to avoid splashing or debris during cleaning um, or anything like that. Storage hierarchy is also critical to ensure cross-contamination is not occurring. I like to think about um, the minimum cook temperatures uh, and how, how to kind of stack them that way. That will kind of guide you as to what levels the product should be stored on. Um, the higher the, the required cook temperature, the, uh, the lower on the shelving it should be. So, you know, poultry needs to be 165, so that, that goes on the bottom. Produce you know, doesn't necessarily need any cooking, so that can be up, up on top, or some of the ready-to-eat foods can be up on top, and you can kind of lay it out from there. It, it, I think it gets a little gray, and again, this is this isn't for the exam or thing. I think it, 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 this is my experience. It gets a little gray when people want to use the same shelf and they, they try to do more like a barrier between them. So I'm going to have something that I can cook to, you know, 145 and 155 or 150 on the same shelf, <laughs> but I'm going to try to kind of keep them separate so that, you know, um, so just some, something to keep in mind in there or, 
or things that maybe may be cooked but may not be cooked, like like bacon. So you can get bacon in raw, or you could get bacon in pre cooked, and sometimes it's not really obvious um, which one it is, if, you know, until you really look closely at the package. So um, just something to keep in mind when you're when you're visiting the restaurant. So. Um, and then here's just some, some general uh, uh, food prep best practices around um, packaging fish, um, pooling of eggs, and then just um, around some ice. So it's important that, that we understand that there's some, some other kind of um, additional exception type things that we want to keep an eye on on a, on a regular basis. And um, some of this could show up on the ground. All right. Uh, you will need a variance when preparing food in certain ways. So a variance is a document issued by you guys, the regulatory authority, uh, that all, uh, allows a regulatory requirement to be waived or changed. Um, oftentimes, you will be required to also have a HACCP plan to include in the variance request. Um, the FDA food, call, food, call, food code calls out a number of specialized processes um, that require these variances, but um, but the local health department may have additional ones as well. So here's here's kind of your your more common ones that the um, the food code lists, and most of the the codes that I've seen list. But like I said, I have seen a few other ones. Or and you know a lot of times it doesn't even have to say that you need one. It just if it's a a, a process or practice that that doesn't fall um, within the rules or the confines of the, the regulation, then, you know, you can ask for an exemption or a variance to, to be, um, be uh, requested or, or used. Uh, another less common preparation method is uh, a partial cook or par cooking. So uh, this needs to be handled carefully to ensure pathogen growth doesn't occur. Most health departments um, will, will require a written approved process in order to allow a facility to use this preparation method. So I would, I would hope that in most cases somebody is, has put together, you know, like a written process on it since, um, since there is some, some um, potential for, for mishandling and, and abuse, unintentional abuse, just because of the process, you know, the way that it goes through the, the cook, chill, cook procedure. So. Uh, consumer advisories are required by law and must be present on menus and other men, uh, means of communications when there is an option to consume raw or undercooked TCS items in the facility. Um, I have seen some, sort of, some jurisdictions have strict requirements about um, how this should appear, um, including like the verbiage, uh, the font, the location on the menus. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind, it, you know, when you're looking at what the rules are within your your state or locality. And I believe you guys in Florida, um, it's based on state code and and requirements. So um, that's something that is important to communicate to um, to the people that you're working with, the facilities that you're working with, so that they have what they need to um, document it. All right. Uh, I believe there are probably going to be some questions kind of around off-site service. Um, I think there's a, a few points here to keep in mind. Uh, delays from the point of preparation to the point of service increase the risk that food will be exposed to contamination or, or temperature, time temperature abuse. So making sure um, that they're using appropriate uh, containers or equipment to hold the food at the correct temperatures to keep it um, keep it protected at all times while it's you know in transport to where it's going um, really should make sure that the they that they've checked the internal food temperature before it leaves the original facility um, and and once it gets to the the end um, the, the end route or the end place um, if containers or delivery vehicles are not holding food at the correct temperature reevaluate the length of the, de the delivery route or the efficiency of the equipment being used. Um, so just making sure that they've got a really good process in place um, to be able to transport food once they're taking it out of sight. And that, I mean, and, and this is talking about like catering and things like that versus, you know, the, the food delivery, the, the, the third party food delivery um, vendors that are out there now. So, okay. So we'll talk a little bit about active managerial control. Um, really what we're thinking when we talk about that is just kind of our food safety program. So these are the foundations of what a food safety management system is, um, is all about. It's important that all food preparation facilities have a robust food safety management system in place to ensure they are producing or serving safe, wholesome food. 
there are some foundational programs that all systems should include, which are listed here, and we're not going to go through every one of them today. <laughs> um, that would be a, another whole other session that we need to go through, but um, we have covered a few of these anyways, you know, for the most part already, uh, and we'll discuss a few more here before we wrap up, but um, these are the main ones that you'll usually see under that. Active managerial control is a preventative food safety management system that is used to prevent foodborne illnesses rather than reacting to an uncontrolled risk factor that is identified once it has occurred. So, you know, very much preventative. It is a way for the manager to assess or inspect the facility on an ongoing basis um, to be proactive or preventive rather than reactive. It is how the food safety programs are implemented and administered by the management team. Um, so, so just something to keep in mind. I think that, uh, again, when you're looking at large chain restaurants, that you'll most likely see more, um, activity and um, more, uh, programs that are built like a, a AMC or active managerial control. I think that smaller mom and pop facilities probably need a little bit more support and help and training around this to make sure that they've got what they need in place. All right, HACCP. So while HACCP in general is not required for retail and food service, um, we're seeing it more and more often, especially if we're doing any kind of a variance or we're doing a specialized process. I see a lot of like MAP and ROP going on where we're doing maybe like Cook Chill or something like that where um, um, we could use the, we would utilize that HACCP program. And again, I believe the exam had about five, four or five questions on this. So something to be familiar with when you're getting ready to take the exam. So uh, there are many systems you can, you know, you can implement to achieve active manager control. Um, and so HACCP is kind of just one of those. Um, HACCP is based on identifying significant hazards, biological, chemical, or physical, at specific points within a product's flow. Um, once you identify those hazards, uh, they, you know, you, you figure out how to prevent, eliminate, or reduce them to safe levels. So, um, and an effective HACCP system must be based on a written plan. So this plan must be specific to each facility's menus, customers, equipment, processes, and operations, um, because each HACCP plan is unique. A plan that works for one operation may not work for another. And I know from a, a retail HACCP perspective, very different from you know, what is expected from a manufacturer. Um, I grew up as, you know, I, I do have a little bit of regulatory background. I was a state meat inspector. And so um, my learning, how I learned uh, uh, HACCP was through kind of that USDA, very formalized, very, um, I think very detailed. And, and at retail, I think we get a, it's a little bit looser and a little bit more specific kind of to what's going on from a retail, more, more geared towards what what we do from a retail perspective. So something to be, really be aware of if, you, if you've kind of dabbled in, in both areas or both sides of, of the spectrum there. So, um, so you, uh, an RS role uh, often includes completing uh, plan reviews. So if you haven't done that yet, it, that could come along at some point. Um, you would be expected to understand what materials, design, and layout is appropriate for a food facility and provide those business owners or those facility owners with direction and feedback when they, uh, they are building, building, um, building some, a new facility, remodeling their facility, or sometimes even just swapping out uh, for new equipment. So some key components of sanitary design um, of equipment and facilities includes um, cleanability, durability, and uh, and that uh, equipment needs to be installed in a manner to make it easy to um, to get around it. So sometimes it's just a matter of like, hey, I can't get under or behind it to to get it clean or or to fix something. So they really need to to be aware of, of how best to set up their facility, build out their facility. <coughs> well, we talked about hand washing so but also we need to think about you know hand washing stations so proper setup and accessibility is critical to make it easy as possible for employees to wash their hands so if i can't get to the hand sink i probably won't bother to try to get to the hand sink if it's if it's too difficult uh water should be warm enough to be comfortable so that's the whole idea is that you don't need hot water to get your necessarily get your hands clean but you're not going to wash them for very long if the water's too cold or too hot um, you want hands to have hand soap that isn't too harsh, um, otherwise they're not gonna wanna wash their hands frequently. <laughs> um, 
uh, and then an easy way to dry their hands safely and, and a place to discard the towels nearby so that they're not like, okay, I'm just going to throw something on the floor or, um, or have to walk forever to go, you know, throw my towel away again. If it's too hard to do it or, you know, there's a lot of challenges or obstacles to doing it, then, then they'll, you know, generally side on, on not doing it, unfortunately. So. Another area that will come up during a plan review or inspection is the water and plumbing setup. So the facility must have a reliable potable water source, so whether that's city water or well water, um, even during a water event like a boil water advisory. So uh, a lot of times a facility can, you know, stay open uh, if they've got sufficient bottled water or ways to boil water. And so again, they should have some good written procedures um, around that to make sure that they're, um, they don't run into any issues um, if they choose to stay open when their normal water source is, is compromised. Um, plumbing should take into account backflow and back siphonage opportunities um, and how to prevent those. There are a number of incidences that would require or influence the need to close the facility. So some are obvious since they wouldn't be able to operate under those conditions. I don't have power, I don't have gas, <laughs> um, my, my facility is flooded. Um, others may have workarounds that need to be done with care and consideration as it increases the risk of a potential foodborne illness like a boil water advisory. Um, or, or if I had a, a backup, a sewage backup, maybe just in one of the bathrooms. Uh, it is becoming more common for health departments to require pre-approved emergency procedure plans uh, to ensure everyone is on the same page and all safety measures have been considered and included. So if that's something um, that, that you guys are requiring, just make sure that the, um, the facilities that you inspect know that so that they can get that information to you and you can review it and get it approved. So every facility should have some type of pest management program in place from mom and pop all the way up to the, the, the big boys. Um, pests are a fact of life. So when it comes to facilities that handle any kind of food, um, they, it's gonna happen. So they will in, inevitably find their way in. Um, it is up to that facility team to have the appropriate preventative and corrective actions in place to deal with them once they do. So it, I like to look at it as a partnership with their pest vendor. Um, that's the only way to really make this happen. Each one has a, a, a part to play in pest prevention and, and eliminating them if they get in. So obviously a, a clean, dry facility will make it very difficult for a pest to get a foothold. Um, and the, the PCO will help lay down materials to help address those few pests that do manage to get in. So if something gets out of control, it's because one or both of those um, those sides have not done something that they needed to do. So another area where it is important to work with the uh, vendor partner as well as ensure that the team is properly educated and trained is on the sanitation program. There's a definite difference between cleaning and sanitizing and both obviously are needed to ensure we have a safe environment in which to prepare food. Um, the facilities need to have a good program in place and ensure it is being uh, properly used properly um, to help prevent both foodborne illnesses as well as as really make sure that um, the team and customers have a good experience when they come in like there's nothing worse than coming into a nasty stinky restaurant <laughs> or, or a store um, whether you're somebody who has to work at it all day long or or just like I said a customer who's coming in from that perspective so I think what what my um, my experience has really been over the years is that um, if if there is a challenge around sanitation it's probably less of them not wanting to do it it's just that they haven't been properly trained how to do it they haven't learned what what chemicals are and how to use them and when to use them, or they're told just do, you know, very straight up, here's, here's what you use here, and this is when you do it, but I'm not gonna teach you anything, you know, or, or you're not gonna learn anything beyond that where you could just kind of apply the information, like get more general cleaning and sanitizing information, and then I'm gonna let you kind of figure out how to apply that in the different situations that might be there. So, so I think there's, there's definitely some opportunity there to, to do a better job of, of training people up. So 
Um, and oh, and so here's one of the uh, tables that I really like um, from a reference perspective. Um, I think that I found this somewhere else and just kind of cobbled it together to give you a, it all in one table here. So, um, and it's really about just, you know, guidelines around the effective use of sanitizer. So it's really important that facilities choose the right sanitizer for their actual needs and that they know how to mix it and then test it on a regular basis. And really this is not only the managers, but any of the, the employees that would be, um, would be handling this, these chemicals should know this as well. Um, along with having different types of cleaners and sanitizers, there's also different application methods. Um, this, there, I don't think there's any real right, you know, or wrong, but again, the facility needs to know how each one works, how to ensure it is effectively mixed and, and used, and when to change it out or refresh it. So, um, at the facilities or the, these businesses are constantly being um, approached by different chemical companies and, and even just these, like, again, app, different application type companies um, to have them switch to them. I know that, you know, I think in general in the industry, we're like, Red Bucket has been around forever. It's, you know, it's acceptable, you know, but is it, you know, best? Is it the best that we could be doing or the best in class or best practice? So um, you'll, you'll see that, that a lot of times we'll, that, you know, we choose the Red Bucket because it's, it's simple, it's easy, it's cost effective, but um, there are other options out there that, that we can use. All right, and then um, when it comes to washing uh, your dishware, smallware, things like that, obviously we've got both machine washing and uh, and manual washing. So dish machines come in a couple different um, different formats. So one is your chemical, one is your your heat sanitizing. Um, definitely, I've seen some questions on the exam around this. So just keep in mind that if it's a high temp. Uh, the final rinse temp on the gauge should be 180, but um, generally on the surface, if you're, if you're temping the surface, it needs to be 165. So if you're putting a thermometer through or there's a lot of times you have those little strip type um, uh, monitoring um, temperature things that you can use on the, to put on the, in the water on the dish. And then chemical sanitizing obviously will be just depending on your, your chemical generally, which is uh, chlorine. So you'll be able to, to check that with the, the test strips as well. And obviously, uh, we want to make sure that the restaurants have those test strips or the thermometers available so that they can monitor um, their dish machines regularly as well so that they're always up and running and it doesn't cause any any um, issues or potential for contamination or uh, foodborne illness. So manual, we're all very familiar with that in terms of the three, you know, three compartment sink. I think the important thing here um, to remind everybody is that first sink with the detergent and water needs to be at least 110 degrees. All right, uh, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, the vomit and diarrhea cleanup. So definitely, if, um, if to be effective, operations must have a written procedure for, for something like this. Um, these procedures must address specific actions that employees must take to minimize contamination um, and exposure to food, surfaces, and people. It's critical that employees be trained on these procedures. So I've seen anything where it's always the manager who does the cleanup to, um, I remember back when, you know, I used to work for Olive Garden and we had bus people, bus boys, the, the bus people would be the ones that would be, you know, trained on this. Um, but it, you need to have somebody who's designated and you need to have somebody um, trained so that they can protect themselves while they're cleaning it up as well as everybody else while they're cleaning up and then, you know, effectively making sure that, that we're, we're cleaning it up. If chemicals are transferred to uh, a new working container, the label on that container must list the common name of the chemical. And it, obviously we don't ever want to put them into food containers where it could be confused that it was some type of food. Um, so the photo on the slide shows a working container uh, labeled with the common name of the chemical. So generally um, you, you would have sanitizer listed as sanitizer. Sometimes you might have to, you know, write it on there. You can get the, a label from your, your chemical vendor. I think like the, the red buckets will have that already etched in somewhere. So it'll be obvious what's, what's there. Um, we want to make sure we have all of the, the safety information available, you know, easily available in case an accident occurs. And, you know, we all know that we should never um, mix chemicals. 
Okay, so that is uh, all of the food safety related information, and I know I've provided you guys with a, a lot of a lot of stuff there. So hopefully that was a good review, either whether you're um, going to be uh, taking the exam or um, are just kind of getting a refresher for your CEUs. Like I said, I sprinkled in some of my own experiences there. So if you have any questions around that. Um, let me know um, we can kind of talk about that. I, I didn't mention in the beginning, so I have, uh, I think I didn't, I've worked for three different uh, restaurant companies, so I, I probably a total of 10 years between Darden and Brinker. Um, Brinker owns Chili's and Maggiano's, if you're not aware. Um, and then now I was at McDonald's for a few months. So I, I've spent a lot of time in restaurants and, and experienced and seen a lot of things. So I was just trying to, um, like I said, sprinkle in a few things in there. So if it, um, if you're unsure of whether it was my experience versus uh, part of the food code or part of what's going to show up on the exam, just let me know and we can, I can clarify that for you. So, okay, so for the last few minutes here, I just wanted to quick go through some, some information around food inspections. So most of you probably um, have completed food inspections or work within, you know, that, the, the food uh, sector. Um, but uh, I wanted to kind of talk through some other stuff just in case, you, ha you know, you haven't experienced some of the, the other things that jurisdictions do. So, like different types of inspection reports. Um, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to collect any food samples. I know I did quite a bit of that back when I was an inspector. Um, and then just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what you look at on, during a document review on an inspection. Um, somebody needs to go on mute. I don't know if that, uh, Mike, Mike, is that you? Thank you. Okay. Anyways, okay, so regulatory agencies. So this will come up, and I think, it, you know, like they listed some of them um, in the different sections of the, uh, the, the review, the, the review guide, the study guide. Um, but I think it's important to really understand hey, whether it's for a review perspective or, um, <laughs> or, uh, or uh, just in general. These are, these are kind of the areas or the agencies, I think, that really kind of oversee different parts of um, a food, the food industry. So whether we're talking about FDA, which is you know generally more around the retail um, and and food service, the you know USDA, which is around more manufacturing of meat, poultry, and eggs. EPA having to do with environment and chemicals. CDC, we've all become very familiar with CDC and working with CDC with the pandemic. Um, OSHA sometimes comes into play. I've seen that kind of crossover now with the pandemic as well. And then um, you know a lot of different. Uh, makeup or, or delegation going on to state, county, and local um, health departments. And I think it's interesting when I'm looking at or working with or different um, different states and, and different local health departments, kind of the verbiage they use um, within, you know, their names. So whether it's environmental health, public health, health department, that type of thing. So, all right. So when, when I think about the, the, the different types of, of um, jurisdictions I've been in, um, I've seen, you know, some similarities. So uh, really looking at the commonalities around the food inspections, um, I've, in general, you'll find that they fall within these categories here, the routine, the reinspection, the complaint, the foodborne illness investigation, um, or just kind of the other ones, the variances or um, or the HACCP plan. So, and I think what generally that doesn't cause too much um, confusion or, or challenges. It's it's when it comes to kind of the scoring and grading. So I've seen anything from where kind of the old school, you had criticals and non-criticals um, or the foodborne illness risk factors and the good retail practices um, where it kind of gives you that two categories and the scoring is kind of similar to the priority, priority foundation and core. Um, and I think I've seen a couple other or diff slightly different ones. Then you've got um, jurisdictions that do letter grades. Some of them that have numerical scores. I think uh, Florida has the meets or does not meet standards. And so as a larger company with lar more um, facilities, it's hard to be able to compare apples to apples with something like that unless you can pull it in and do some kind of, um, of a standardization of all that information uh, to pull that together. So... Uh, so yeah, so so I think it's really kind of interesting to to understand all of that. 
Okay, um, sample collection. So sometimes the situation arises when you will be required to do some sample, uh, sample collections. Uh, the two critical points I think here is that the sample is handled in a manner to avoid any kind of contamination um, and that it is properly secured to arrive at the lab without any tampering or temperature abuse. So uh, making sure that, you know, you know, you wash and sanitize your hands, put on your gloves, pull plenty of the sample that, you know, or, you know, at least what you need and maybe some more um, just to make sure the lab's getting, you know, what they need to be able to run what they what they need to do. Um, and then ensuring that kind of that chain of custody doesn't get broken. So once you seal it up, um, it, it shows up at the lab in the, in the same, you know, in the same condition. Um, and then just from a, a shipping perspective, just making sure that you're, you're uh, shipping it under whatever the normal condition, storage conditions would be. So rarely do you pull frozen because it would be hard to manage frozen and we generally just don't. Um, don't have a need to, to sample frozen, but if it's refrigerated, to make sure it stays refrigerated, doesn't end up getting frozen for some reason, um, or if it's ambient, it kind of stays at that ambient temperature. Uh, there may be some situations where you will be required to complete a documentation review. Usually this is done when approving variances, HACCP plans, exemptions, or you know, plan reviews. Um, I've listed a few uh, here that may also be reviewed during routine uh, routine inspections, reinspections maybe. Uh, some companies may require their local teams to complete corrective actions for their health department inspections. So um, you could always ask about that, or you may be required to check on a variance or have the plan while doing a routine inspection. Um, all of these are required to be on hand, either manually or electronically. Uh, and available for review by the inspector upon request. So we're, we are, a, you know, as a company, we generally are aware of what needs to be there. I, I would say definitely you're going to see more and more um, being um, being stored electronically, being completed and stored electronically, especially around training. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind and work with the, the facility to let them know what, you know, what your expectations are in terms of being able to um, present that to them, provide it and present that to them during the inspection. Uh, you may, uh, your role may also require you to inspect temporary events or food transportation vehicles. Um, obviously, the usual food safety standards and best practices apply to these situations as well. So I would be aware of what, you know, whatever they have in the training materials that was suggested. If there are some different um, kind of rules around that, you'll want to, um, you want to make sure that you're, you understand that so that you can answer those questions. All right, we have covered a lot of information this morning. I'm sure your heads are spinning. I feel like mine is. Um, uh, and there's probably plenty more that you've read and all those recommended resources for, for, the, uh, for the exam um, can be a bit overwhelming. So for the last few minutes, um, I want to run through a few sample questions uh, to get you prepared for what you might, they may ask you on those exams. So. Um, as we go through these, I think I've got, I don't know, six or seven of them. Go ahead and type your answer in the chat box, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll reveal the answer once we, you know, we've got a few. So I'll give everybody about, you know, 20 seconds to, to answer the question, and then we'll, we'll reveal it. So, okay, why are some foods classified as time temperature control for safety? A, they have a pH below 4.2. B, they have uh, water activity below 0 0.85, they support rapid growth of pathogenic microorganisms, or D, they require rapid and thorough cooking. Quick look. All right, looks like we're getting a bunch of C's. C, C, C. Okay. You are absolutely right. They support rapid growth of pathogenic microorganisms. Okay, what is the minimum period of time that the FDA recommends employees wash their hands and arms up to the elbow? A, 10 seconds, B, 20 seconds, C, 30 seconds, or D, 40 seconds? Let's see those answers. All right, B, 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 20 seconds, B, A, B, all right. All right, you remember we were talking about this when we were on this slide, it is actually 10 seconds, 10 
to 15 seconds for the scrubbing, 20 seconds for the entire process. So keep that in mind because that has changed. Um, so when we do the, when you do the exam, we we'll want to make sure we capture that. Okay, what is the source of gombroid poisoning? A, histamines in the muscle of fish. B, sprouted green potatoes. C, undercooked pork. Or D, rice contaminated with rodent feces. All right, looks like we're getting A, 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 A. All right, that's a good one. Yep, A, histamines in the muscle of fish. So like I said, I think uh, if I recall, they, they have a few fish seafood type questions on there. So definitely want to be aware of those. Um, a half a plan is not required when A, smoking foods as a method of preservation, B, cooling and reheating TS, TCS foods in bulk, C, performing reduced oxygen packaging, or D, using food additives or adding other components to preserve food or render it non-TCS. All right, looks like we got B, 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 B. All right. And you are correct. So we do not need to uh, have it when we're cooling and reheating TCS foods in bulk. That's just a normal process that, that we use every day. All right, what should not be done with food samples collected during a foodborne illness investigation? A, refrigerate, B, freeze, C, seal, D, label. All right, looks like we're getting B, 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 B. Correct. We do not want to freeze it unless it was already frozen, but in general, like I said, you will rarely be pulling a frozen product or frozen samples. Insecticides or pesticides may be stored in all ways except A, in a metal locked cabinet, B, on the lowest shelf in the storage room, C, above the dishwashing sinks, or D, in the basement separate from food and other chemicals. Okay, seeing a lot of C's coming through, which is good because that's the right answer. Above the dishwashing sink, we won't want it to be able to spill down onto uh, clean dishes or food preparation that might be going on. All right, floors in food processing plants, dairy plants, kitchens, and similar places should be sloped how much towards each drain? So is it one inch per foot, one quarter inch per foot, a half inch per foot, or 0 0.05 inches per foot? This is a little harder one, so this is something you'll have to you need to remember or pull out of your uh, your studies. All right, we got D, we got C, we got B, C, C. All right, so it's actually uh, a quarter. So it was one eighth to one quarter inch per foot was the answer on that one. Okay, hemolytic uremic. Syndrome is caused by an infection with this. A, Shigella, B, Listeria, C, Hepatitis A, or D, E. coli 0157H7. All right. So it looks like everybody's familiar with H, U, F. So D, D, D. Yep, we are correct. E. coli causes the H, U, S. All right. Proper facility lighting is essential for. A, cleanliness, B, accident prevention, C, fatigue reduction, or D, all of the above. D, 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 I yep, everybody's got, very good, so that is correct. You would want to have proper uh, foot candles, and you'll want to know your foot candles for the different areas for the exam as well um, in order to uh, help with those questions. So. Fantastic. Well, you guys did a great job on the um, on the, the quizzes. Uh, and thanks for hanging out with me, uh, hanging in there with me today. Uh, I hope you found this review session very helpful or valuable use of your time. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. It has, um, it has always been my belief that uh, food safety is not a competitive advantage. We are all here for the same reason and all in this together. So in the last minute if there's anything um, anybody quick wants to ask or share feel free um, I believe my email address Mike did you provide my email address with with the invite I'm happy to share that if anybody wants to reach out at any point in time 
um, and, and just collaborate, collaborate. on food safety. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, that was very informative. I really enjoyed listening to that. Um, please yeah, share your email address. I did not send that out with everybody. Okay. Uh, for those of you that are calling uh, calling in and not on the app, uh, please email info at fiha.org so I can uh, with your name so that I can check you into the class so that you get your certificate. Um, uh, everybody else that was on the call, I checked you in already, um, unless I sent you a private message. Uh, a couple of quick reminders. Um, NEHA is hosting their AEC online this year. Uh, it's going to be three separate dates, uh, April 20th to the 21st, June 1st to June 2nd, and July 14th to July 15th. And you can sign up on NEHA.org. Uh, the Florida Environmental Health Association, uh, our group, um, we're still deciding on whether we're doing in-person or doing webinars or what we're going to do for our uh, AEM this year, so stay tuned for emails from me uh, about the fate of the FIHA AEM for 2021. Uh, our next webinar will be on April 2nd. Uh, it'll be a two-hour webinar uh, on splash pads presented by Lauren Broom uh, of FIHA. Um, with that, um, this presentation uh, will be made available for review. Uh, I do have to edit the video and upload it. Um, only FIHA members, anybody who is an active FIHA member, has access to the entire presentation uh, on FIHA.org backslash distance learning. Uh, if you're not a FIHA member, FIHA offers free one-year memberships. All you have to do is email info at FIHA.org and let me know you want your free one-year membership if you've never been a member. Uh, if you have let your membership lapse, uh, if you have any problems, just give me a call or email me uh, and we will uh, work with you to get your membership uh, reinstated for you. Uh, with that, I want to thank all of you for coming um, and have a great day.